Hey guys, it's Carolyn with Homesteading Family and welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat. Today, we're obviously not in the pantry. No. We are in Utah and I'm here with Stacy from Off Grid with Doug and Stacy. I'm really excited to have you here. I know, it's so nice to finally meet you. Know. You know, it's kind of neat. You know, you see these people on YouTube and on videos <laughs> and things and it's like you get to meet them you know, face to face, that's really cool. Yeah, well, and you guys know that when we're recommending other YouTube channels, Doug and Stacy is one of the ones that we recommend because you guys are actually living the lifestyle. And it's so valuable, so many, just like you, so, so many channels are out there and we love them. We think they're great, but a lot of times they're learning themselves or they're kind of just taking you along on their journey. And that's great. We love those things. They show some of the beginning mistakes and all of that. But if you're actually trying to learn how to live the lifestyle, it's great to be learning from people who are actually doing it, actually immersed in it. And um, Doug and Stacy have been living seriously off grid for how long now? It's going on 13 years this year. 13 yeah. years. So um, for those of you guys who follow the pantry chat every week, you know, Josh and I have been talking about off grid. We've been talking about kind of this misnomer that just throwing up some uh, solar panels takes you off grid right and about all the different types of off grid that we really need to look of at course. it's not just the electrical grid right right it's basically like we say off grid it's we don't have any public utility right so we don't have any bills coming to our house because we don't we are like our own sewer person we are an electric person we're our own gas person we just do it all that is amazing so. and it's very rare to be able to find somebody who's living it to that level um, and so I'm really excited to today be talking about some of the practicalities, like what is that like to actually live day to day? But first, we can't forget the chit chat because that's my favorite part, especially when we have a guest on. Yeah, it's fun. fun. Um, so I wanted to share with you guys right now, we are here in Redmond, Utah. I don't think that's the actual technical city we're in, but we're here at the Redmond Salt Mines. Is that what you would yep, say? Yeah, Salt guess? Mines. And we've been having a blast. We're here for the Homesteader Summit and uh, learning a lot about salt, but we also yesterday went down to 800 feet. Oh, yes, in the mine. <laughs> I mean, it was so cool. I, we were surrounded by salt. It was just amazing. It was so beautiful. And what I thought was really interesting is the entire mine is salt. They said, go lick the walls. Like, everything in here is salt. Yeah, the, the, you're driving on it. You're driving, I thought, oh my gosh, you're driving on it, the walls all the way above. I mean, it was, and it's, it's just so cool. It really yeah. is. It's a different experience to be down there that day. Big, big caverns that they've opened up. So it's really been a lot of fun to be down here and be, get to hang out with some other people. Um, and really learning a lot about salt. I think I'm gonna have a video coming out for you guys just about the health of salt. I know a lot of times, every time I mention something like use healthy salt for this, people push back and they're like, salt's just sodium chloride, that's all it is. No, it's and not. And I go, oh no, it's not. And I'm really learning about that here. It's been very interesting. Oh, it's wonderful. I mean, it's just, it's amazing how I think over the years, how the media and people, things that are good for us, you know, they make it bad for us and then people are getting sick because they're not doing these things, right. you know, because salt is good for us. We need it. Your body is yeah. made up of those those trace minerals that we need. The human body needs those. And then this unrefined salt, like the Redmond salt, is filled with it and your body needs it. It's so, so important um, as opposed to an iodized salt or a refined salt that's been high heat processed, has any caking agents in right. it, and it's just terrible for the body and the body doesn't know what to do. Yeah. It thinks it's getting minerals and it's not getting anything. So it's, it's so crucial for our bodies. Well, and I was just learning that a lot of our table salt actually has sugar in it. Um, especially in Canada, it actually will say it right on the label wow. that it has sugar added into it. And I guess it has to do with the anti-caking sure. and just different parts of it. And it's, you know, this is so great because they were sharing here yesterday that the Redmond salt has over 20 trace minerals that your body needs. I think and it's so, even more than that. I bet it's yeah, more it's like, than that. I think it's like 60. It's amazing. Yeah. And so you're getting all these great things, especially since we've lost it from our food supply. And from a lot of our soils that yeah. we're growing. I know even for us every day, we drink, you know, we have water. We, we live off 100% off rainwater that yeah. we catch off our barn. Um, and I'll put a pinch of salt in our water every single day so uh, that way you're getting those trace minerals it's really important for the body that is so good so much fun okay so just for a little bit more chit chat though 
what have you been, I know you've been up to being here and you actually drove a ways to be out here. We did, we drove. Utah is a long ways it's from your house. It's a very long drive, yeah. <laughs> it was a over, little over 18 hours. But what have you been doing on your homestead for the last week before you jumped in the van Let's and see. drove out here? Well, we were getting a little good weather. I always try to get my onions and potatoes in uh -huh. by March 17th. That's my goal always. So I got quite a few in. I'm gonna probably put more in. I had a bag, um, I had acquired a few bags of Yukon potatoes uh, that I had gotten from the Amish and they okay. were really sprouting. So they were getting, trying to get rid of them really quickly. And so I bought a bunch of organic potatoes. So I put up some extra Yukon Golds this year because I do the Kennebex and I also do the Red Pontiac. I, I like those a lot too. So um, what are your favorite potatoes? You know, so we always do a russet, a Yukon Gold okay. and a red, but I cannot tell you the variety of the red that we're growing right now okay. because we have this great local organic farm sure. that grows mostly root but where we're at in north idaho we do root veggies really well sure. <laughs> because they can handle the frost yeah you got the good climate. like you've got to be able to put something in that's not too sensitive up sure, there. sure and so um we just they also sell seed potatoes so we just went and got whatever they had and the label the varieties weren't labeled but they've done so well for us that we're just like they're just the red potatoes yeah. we don't know what they and are I think they're the other red. Ones, there's a norland it's called red norland those okay. are the two good red ones i think the norland and the pontiac i feel so. like they might be pontiac Okay. but I am not 100% sure. On that. But they're good. So they're <laughs> good they're and they grow really well and they, yeah, ours, ours, we don't have an actual root cellar or a great place to store them. And so we're still working on that part of our storage. So I had to translate them to their next life. You know, they went, sure, they sure. went from root storage into the freeze dryer and into, uh, you know, some stews and different things that went into jars on the shelf. So keeping that going. That's but good. Good, yeah. So you're already planting things out in the ground and that's exciting. Just a few, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also did, um, my sugar, one thing with the sugar snap peas. Oh yeah. You have to get them in a few weeks before your last frost date. You yeah. know, a lot of times people wait and sometimes it's like, why aren't they growing? It's because they don't they like the heat hot. at all. So I did some sugar snap peas and I'm trying to think. Oh, I did, I went ahead and planted some seeds like cilantro because I know it'll pop up. It'll take a little bit. It needs a little warmth, but it'll pop up because it likes the cool weather. Yeah. And you know, some herbs, parsley, some arugula. I did, I, oh, I had some um, red romaine. Huh. Yeah, just a few things because you know, I. I you never know because sometimes you get earlier season mm -hmm. and I just plant extra things and sometimes if it gets too cold and they're going to die, you know, then I'm going to plant some more again. At least I know I'll have some extra because we have cold frame too. So I have a cold frame in front of the house, which is a box made out of um, tough text panels and uh, it's just made out of cedar that Doug okay. had made and it works out great. I just go ahead and I'll plant things and many of my things will last throughout the winter in there. Oh, that's like nice. Some of your kale and even my parsley I have my parsley parsley's a rock star right <laughs> so uh I have a little bit of that right now too so it's it's going good I'm just like excited good. for that and then I'm bottle feeding a lamb which is a lot of work but oh. I'm getting them down to two bottles a day so that'll help me out a lot wow so you have somebody at the farm yes right now yes bottle yeah. feeding for you yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a good time to go on yeah she's, she's sending me a picture so it's good oh good yeah. that's good well I figure early spring planting is the kind of gambling I like to do yeah it's like that the odds are pretty much in my favor I kind of have a 50 percent chance of winning right sure and I put it, the seeds out and if if I lose and they all get frozen a packet of seed costs three bucks so right. <laughs> it works for me and you can plant it you can plant it again because yeah. that's what I do a lot of people are like oh I planted this and it died I'm like well I always plant extra like for zucchini right you know you never know those squash bugs are all over the place so I'll plant three or four as opposed to just one mm -hmm. and then I have garden beds and I'll plant them all over the place so you know it just depends like I companion plant so I'll plant maybe you know, a variety of tomatoes, peppers or whatever, and herbs in one, and maybe I'll do eggplant. You know, I just kind of mix it up. And then that way, if I have a tomato plant over here, maybe that had some problems and then over at this one might, may not. And the same for the squash bugs and for my kale and my broccoli or cruciferous vegetables, I just kind of move them around because some yeah. of them do better than others. Yeah. Because I learned the hard way. We had a, I had a mulch pile kind of close to our garden and you're not really supposed to have your mulch pile close to your garden okay. because those squash bugs can overwinter in very, very cold temperatures uh. underneath the, your, your compost because it stays warm. Mm -hmm. And then when you uh, get ready to plant again and you're planting kind of near it it'll they get just, inundated by those right bugs they're like oh look I have more fun to eat so, <laughs> so I learned the hard way that I don't want to have my my mulch pile near my where I put my garden yeah stuff. that would make sense yeah yeah 
Good. Well, my main garden is still under snow last when we left. Okay. We still have a nice probably inch of snow on the main crop garden. The cottage garden though is completely defrosted and I was out there starting my battle against the grass. Oh, I have because it it's my perennial up. garden sure. and I'm, I'm trying to work out, we have grass walkways sure. in it which I kind of keep thinking, I don't think this was the most brilliant idea to put grass walkways next to my time. garden. <laughs> Do I, time. Okay, I just did a video about herbs too. Okay, good. time is good, you can put that in your... Just well, and that's interesting because I do have lots of time in there, but maybe just line the, the plant, the walkways with it. Where it's coming it. up, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's it's pretty large, and um, I'm thinking about putting the edging in all the way around the walkways. Okay. As much as that would be a lot of work. And then getting all the grass out of there and putting flagstones down. And then I love the little ground cover um, chamomile. Oh yeah, the lower that, that yeah, all the way in there. That's is oh. that the Roman? I that's the Roman. I I can never keep the two. The straight. one's shorter. The, the short one is one, yeah. and then there's the tall the one. The German is the taller one, and the Roman is the okay. low. Okay. And so one. the German is the annual. So that's the one. Yeah, year, that's yeah. the one. But mm -hmm. chamomile is just crazy because I learned that the hard way too. I would a lot of my stuff. I like to do easy gardening, oh, so I just like things to reseed itself. Reseed so. itself. <laughs> but chamomile has seeds that are so tiny; they'll just like poof. You just blow it away. There's like so little. They float. They go everywhere. And then the first year, this is many years ago, I just kind of let it go to seed. Right. I had chamomile going. It was like over by our house <laughs> in the rocks. I had it. I have it growing everywhere, which is nice. I like it because right. you can pull it up and transplant it where you want, mm -hmm. and it works out good. But uh, just know that it will do that. But chamomile. Yeah. Is Luckily, wonderful. in our climate, we have things don't tend to be as invasive because they have such a hard winter. So I also have my chamomile self sowing and it actually is behaving itself oh, good. pretty nicely. You have better temperatures. Now, there <laughs> there are a lot of other things in my cottage garden that are not behaving and I've gotten to where I don't have to plant anything pretty much now, but I I am pulling them up by the bucket full. Yeah. Like, you know, my Ella campaign is spreading like is crazy. I, all of it, all of it. And then of course I've got a big wall of hops and that just wants to take over everything. Oh, okay. And so it's it's kind of fun, but I figure I've gone from that stage where you're planting and putting in to the stage where I'm just ripping it out. Sure, I'm sure. so merciless. Giving it to your friends. I Don't am, you want to grow this? Don't I'm you want to grow this? I'm like Facebook, you know, in the local groups. Anybody come take out, you know, shovelfuls of herbs, whatever you want, just come yep. take it. So that, that's kind of my thing. So I've started that annual war that I right. have going of just like keeping things in their place and keeping the grass out of it. Right. The gra and, it is harder yeah. than grass, but you do have to kind of dig it out. You do. You know, and it gets down there pretty deep. Yes. Yes. And so I like go through the entire, and it is a big garden and I go through the whole thing once a spring and like try and rip out all the sure, roots. Sure. You have to do that. I, otherwise you're going to be in a mess in a few weeks because <laughs> you're going to have too much grass everywhere. <laughs> okay. So we're going to move on to the question of the day now, which I, I can't remember who it's from and I doubt I can pull it up that fast but somebody was asking about how to get clean unwashed eggs and if you've watched my video on egg preservation you'll know that there's different methods of egg preservation um, and some of them require you to leave the bloom on, on the eggs which is that protective waxy coating that comes out naturally from the chicken that allows your eggs to just sit on the counter sure. alone for weeks on end. Months. Um, mu a really yeah. long time. Ma many, many months. If you have cooler temperatures, yeah. like, cause we live off grid and yeah. so I, my eggs are sitting out all the time. So yeah. I could keep them um, in winter where it's cool. Mm -hmm. I could keep them many, many months right when they're fresh. See. As opposed to in the heat, like, you know, you think about it, people in these hot countries, you yeah. know, all over the place, they're just having their eggs out. I leave my eggs out, but when it's very, very hot and humid, and let's say our cabin's like 100 degrees and yeah. it's really, really hot, they're not gonna last as long. Right. They might get a little more runny when you crack them open. Um, and that time, you know, they may all be good for a couple months, but generally they will last a while. They so last don't wash a really the bloom off time. because that's, and then a lot of people wash, when you wash the bloom off, that bacteria that you get could mm -hmm. go inside. So you have to be careful how you do it. Now our viewers who are in other parts of the world, like Europe, think we're kind of crazy because they don't, even right. though commercial eggs are not washed just because of the health protection sure. of having the bloom on the eggs. But here in the United States, commercial eggs are required to be washed. So if you want to use some of these old fashioned preservation methods, like just leaving them out on the counter. You know what I think of a lot? So this is, you know, when a woman has a baby uh -huh. and the woman has the, the baby naturally, uh -huh. 
So they're getting that, um, their immune system, mm -hmm. is, they're just being washed, you know, as they come out of the birth canal. And it's kind of the same thing for the egg, you know, you're getting that protective coating. And uh -huh. so it kind of helps the child, it helps the egg, and it just helps to preserve it. Kinda it kind of helps make it, all of it. Yeah. It yeah, really yeah. is good. But you don't want to have poop on your eggs. No. <laughs> you no. don't want to have dirty eggs, especially if you're doing something like a lime solution where you're storing the eggs in a bucket for extended periods of time. You really don't want to be putting manure, chicken manure, no, into no. those solutions. Um, so how do you get a clean, unwashed eggs? To some people that sounds like a misnomer, right? Like, aren't all clean eggs washed? No. 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 They don't have to be. No, so not at all. So what are your tricks for keeping your eggs clean? Well, I think the big thing with when your eggs is to keep your nesting boxes full of straw or yeah. some type of matter. So, because if they have a nice nesting box, because just like you, do you want to sleep in a bed, you know, that you have all wrinkled pillows and your sheets are all messed up? You know, it's kind of the same thing. So when I keep my nesting boxes full of straw, um, they are happy to go in there and then they lay them and then when it's very nice and clean, the eggs are going to stay clean. Because a lot of times if they're in there, they're going to poop in there, or whatever. So you just make sure you just keep it nice and um, tidy, you know, putting that straw in there. And then another thing that I've been doing is I grow a lot of perennial herbs like you. I grow a lot of mint. And I do have some mint that has gone kind of crazy. I decided <laughs> an experiment around my blackberries to put it between the blackberries just to help. Well, it took over, but it was good for me because I'm using that for my chicken coops. So it grows pretty tall. So in the middle of summer, I'll go ahead and cut it from the bottom. And then I have all these, you know, tall pieces. And then I'll just kind of break it apart, cut it up and throw it in the coop. So it deodorizes it in the summer mm. months. And then I also will put it in their nesting boxes because oh. the smells they just love. Um, I also will, toward the end of the season, I'll cut it, I just let it drop, and then I'll let it dry, or I'll hang it, either either way, whatever I'm doing. Because for some of you guys that don't know, that's a, a herb that will dry very nicely for teas, because mm -hmm. uh, it's full of essential oils, and it will keep its flavor throughout the season as you dry it. So I go ahead and I'll tie it and I'll hang it until it dries, and then I'll use that and crunch it, and I'll put it and throw it in the coop, because it's going to help against pests, deter against, you know, mites and parasites and things like that. And also the smell helps them, makes them happy. The chickens, they love it. Um, it makes them want to lay more. Right. And I just keep that also in their nesting boxes. So it's just another thing to help. So See, that's great. That's so good to get those because you have the insect repellent. Sure aspect of that too and, and your really coops smell the good night. and the, the coop they smells smell good. great when you're in the middle of something like mud season if you live in a place where you have mud season it can mean that you have to put fresh nesting material in every your boxes day every single day um and i know feet, their feet yeah, they're just muddy. they're muddy that that's just the way it is as the summer progresses and things dry out you shouldn't have that kind of problem people ask me all the time what about duck eggs I'm sorry, duck eggs are dirty. <laughs> yeah, they are, they <laughs> That's are. the way it is. But they, they are, I think they're made though to be like that because yeah. they're out in the you know dirt and the mud all the time and so they have a thicker shell because it's much harder to break. Right. So I think they're a little bit more protected over right. some of the others because some of them I know they've been out, I've gotten them around our pond and you know they've been there for a while. Uh -huh. And you'll crack them and you think, oh, they're gonna be bad, but they're still good. Yeah. Well, and the thing with the duck eggs too, and even the chicken eggs, it's important to remember, you don't have to worry about a little bit of mud. Like, that's not bad, that's not a problem. In fact, you probably end up with protective elements but from sure. it if you have good bacterial content in your soil. But what you're really looking to avoid when you're bringing it into the kitchen and storing it for long term is the manure. Sure. That's what you're really looking for. So don't be too thrown off by little streaks of mud or little bits right. like that. That's not that big. Well, and another one too is when you get a cracked egg. Yes. Which is so annoying because you'll have this beautiful nest of maybe a dozen eggs and then there's one cracked one and it ruins all of them and it gets it all over. So the big thing for that is don't let your eggs, you know, sit there for a long time. Make sure you're collecting your eggs because then they'll stand on them and they can break them and that really causes a problem. Yes. Or those are the eggs that you're going to eat right away yeah. if they get like that. There you go. Good thoughts. Okay, well, let's jump into the topic of the day. I'm really excited to be talking to you about it because we've never gone completely off the power grid personally. We have focused on developing the skills and the infrastructure to allow us to be able to just go completely off grid sure, sure. at some point and not kind of the hybrid like you know, generate our own power of course. in our own home. And so, again, it's just super rare to be able to discuss with somebody who's actually doing it what that's like day to day 
Um, I know there's a glorified version of that, right? Of there's course, the romantic yeah. oh, version that course. says, I want to sit in the rocking chair by, by uh, you Your know, lantern yeah. light yeah. and like, oh, that'd be so wonderful. But there's also the day-to-day -day reality that you are actually doing life every single day in this place. And so talk to us about just the challenges, the benefits, what you've learned along the way. Um, well, so we've been doing this about 13 years. And uh, when we first moved out there, I mean, we moved, you know, from the air conditioning, we moved from having lights until 11 o'clock at night, you know, we had all that. So when we moved out there, there was a little transition, you know, it, it, it was it was cool. I mean, we had to work hard at the time. We didn't have running water at all. Okay. We hadn't figured out our systems. We hadn't put them in place. Um, and you know we had to wear your headlamps and you know have to do everything that you're going to do and in the middle of winter you know at 4 30 it starts to get dark you know so you have all those hours you're going to do things if you're going to prepare your food you're going to do whatever so that took a little adjusting but i'll tell you over because we have the lanterns and you have to get ready you know for the lights to kind of dim but really your body is made you know your circadian rhythms to kind of slow down the sun starts to go down and those dim lights. So it started changing our health is the ah. big thing. So I started noticing we were sleeping better, uh, that our health was better, uh, just everything about it because our circadian rhythms were really kind of getting back in sync again. Yeah. So you get tired at a certain time, you know, at like nine o'clock, eight o'clock, you're like, you know, oh my gosh, it's time to go to bed. I Doug would be like, oh, it's, you know, I'm tired. Let's go to bed and be six o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, over time, you know, you kind of, your body adjusts to that. And it's like no big deal for me now. Like I'll go places and it's kind of dark. Yeah. People are like, turn the lights on. I'm like, because it doesn't bother me. I'm, I'm used to that. And uh, it, it was just one of those kind of things that you just do it day after day. Mm -hmm. And you just start to get, start to get used to it. And it's caught. And it, another big part was getting into with nature. Yeah. I think a lot of us, you know, even let's say you do have a farm and you're raising chickens or you're having a garden and all that. There's a lot of people that just stay inside all the time. You know, they're staying inside, hanging out, doing their things. They might just go outside and come back in. But I think a big component of this, and especially if you want to talk about our health and um, you being in tune with nature, is being outside. Mm. And mm -hmm. being outside, and it's really important to be outside first thing in the morning, mm. especially before nine o'clock, because you want to kind of get your eyes set to the sunlight mm -hmm. because that will set your circadian rhythms. It will help your serotonin levels. It's going to help you to sleep better. It's going to help your hormones all over to get that sunlight, especially, it, you know, getting it on your skin because that's the best way, about 20 minutes or so to help absorb, you know, getting that vitamin D and then eating good foods, you know, you're growing a garden. So it's not just eating foods. It's, it's all, all of it. It's getting out in nature. It's, you know, getting good sleep. So for some of you guys that don't live off grid like I do, you know, maybe having candles or a lantern that you can dim the lights, or if you have a lamp that you can dim the lights, the big thing and the studies show, you know, we get our sun from the sky, right? <laughs> and it sets <laughs> down on you. So in your home, when you have those bright lights shining down on you, that's what's going to cause the problem where your cortisol levels are going to go up, you know, when it's time for bed and then you're watching these screens in front of you. So it's really important to keep the light dim them where it's like lower. You don't want it above you because that's going to affect you. So I've read about how people even, um, you know, in the forties and the fifties, even when they started having electric lamps, they didn't have the big full room lighting necessarily sure. and they would often keep the rooms dimmer the rest of sure. the house would be dark so even though they had electricity they were still kind of implementing some of right. those things and that they just they weren't used to what we're used to which is you know these glaring bright led lights over us and lighting everything all the time right. and so it's a very different thing for your health and it's really interesting well and a lot of people are like oh i can't lose weight i'm having problems you know i eat good i even exercise what's wrong why can't i lose weight for a lot of you guys and people think eh, you know it's, it's really nothing your sleep is a huge component i can't talk <laughs> a huge component to your health uh -huh. huge i mean i can't tell you enough you want to get that good deep sleep you know you go up and down your cycles you know like five six times you know you want to get into that good deep sleep mm -hmm. and by setting just doing simple things like you know uh putting your filter on that blue light filter on your phone or your computer uh don't have the screen in front of you at least mm -hmm. an hour before you go to bed dim the lights you want to set the mood 
and especially you don't have your your phone or anything like that electrical by your head because mm. those electromagnetic frequencies are going to affect your brain waves you know it's very important that you set the stage you should have a nice little nest in your room don't have any of that technical stuff near you at all by your head at all put it in the kitchen get it away from you and then, then you'll sleep because if you start getting good sleep because it, it, it'll help everything because if you're not getting the right sleep then your cortisol levels are raised your hormones everything gets whacked out and then your body's thinking oh it's fight or flight and you're going to store body fat and it's just not good so if you're in bed between between like 10 10 30 no later than 11 and then you know you get up because we're used to going to bed slow, shortly after the sun goes down and getting up when the sun's coming up you'll notice a lot of health benefits if you're consistent with that so it's not a it's not crazy you need to start doing stuff like that because it really will help it your health it really does and that's then you may really even notice you start losing weight if, if you're storing weight certain places it's huge that's really interesting and that's kind of like one of those just side benefits of going off grid like that's not even something most people are thinking about right. but just it naturally controls how much electricity you can use and so it's sure you're controlling your light but that's just a side effect so right. i think that's really neat so what would you say the number one like on a day-to-day -day basis the biggest challenge with being off grid i want to call it like off off grid because i think we really have to define the difference between being off grid where you're just mimicking being on grid because you have all the power generation that you want sure. and that's a, versus it's a big difference well and that's a big thing for a lot of people because they go off grid thinking that they're going to have everything that they had before right. you know they're having all the plugs or having the air conditioning because air conditioning you have to have a lot of solar yeah. i mean it's not going to be like a ten thousand dollar unit for solar you're going to have to have fifty sixty seventy thousand dollars i mean if you want to have everything that you had on grid so that's what a lot of people do okay. see we went off grid not having anything so if i get a little bit of something it's good <laughs> but you know it is it's, it is definitely um something i think and you, wait you were talking about the health aspects of it but besides just the sleep it's changed my whole life oh it, it helped between doug and i just changing from the foods uh -huh. getting out in nature lowering the stress getting the sleep I mean, it was a whole full circle. Then we go barefoot, so we're grounding with the earth. People are wearing shoes all the time. You need to be connected to the earth, letting go of the, you know, electricity, static electricity in your body, and that will help ground you because people are used to wearing those shoes. So you have that rubber sole mm -hmm. that is putting you away from the earth, and we are like one with the earth. So you'll notice, and there's thousands of studies that show. Um, people who are grounded or walk barefoot against some type of natural you know like rocks or grass or the ocean mm -hmm. and then when you add water to it it really helps you to heal and helps with inflammation and pain and um and a lot of people are like i am not going to go barefooted and walk around well you don't have to you could sit in a chair no matter how old you are take your shoes off put them in the ground especially dewy grass or something like that and see if you start noticing doing that every day for 15 20 minutes read a book or do something like that and see if you're pain or inflammation lowers so it's all these things put together that totally helped our because we knew where our food was coming from mm -hmm. uh, it totally changed our health yeah. you know at first when we moved here you know doug suffered he had kind of some allergies i had a little bit of allergies you know we're out in nature that in the foods we're eating everything just changed so we are healthier now than we were in our 20s and our 30s well and you think about things like off-grid food preservation you're probably going heavily and i know you just from watching your videos heavily towards the fermentation sure, sure. like that is that is like the off-grid preservation and it is amazing we've really put that in this box of little condiments that you have to keep in your fridge like mentally mm -hmm. and i've started doing so much with long-term fermentation oh my gosh now. of course i mean it can sit in my pantry shelf for a year and a half and of i course. can pull it off and eat it and it's great yep. and very 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 probiotic at that point like very alive and so you know just making those changes right there moving away from so much you know we love our canned food. It has a place in our preservation toolkit. Sure. But when you start moving away from some of that and adding in a lot of these alive foods, it's really, it does stuff to you. It does oh, it's amazing huge. things to your health. Oh, and that's my thing. Like if I don't have my sauerkraut or some fermented vegetable every day, I mean, it makes me feel happier because yeah. you know, you have billions or trillions of bacteria in your, in your gut. So 
most people have too many bad bacteria and that's what causes disease and sickness and things like that. So if you incorporate that into your, the good bacteria into your gut, it's very helpful and it does affect because your second gut is in your brain. Yeah. Or no, your, sec your, your second, your gut is brain. your second brain. <laughs> yeah. So it's really, uh, it, it makes me, I feel happier if I have a ferment. You go to the bathroom regularly. It just is just one of those things that everything is just functioning mm -hmm. much better. So I try, I know I have, my salsa will last a long time. Yeah. I've had some of them, I've got two years, I shouldn't say, <laughs> but some things that I haven't eaten, yeah. but it is, it is one way, because we moved out there and I don't, I still don't really have refrigeration. Um, we have the root cellar now, but before, you know, we have to think of some creative ways to keep mm -hmm. things cool and, um, fermenting was definitely the way and some things of course aren't going to last as long yeah. some things will last longer and you know through practice and trial and error you learn a lot but you can ferment a lot of things and they will last throughout the season so yeah. and Great. it's good for you it's not dead it's an alive food it's really exciting yes. it's yes. really exciting okay so I'm gonna come back to the question though what is the most challenging day-to-day -day in terms of living um, living completely off-grid like that Ooh. See, now it's a hard question. I don't know if I could even, it's not okay, really so a challenge. Okay, so what about when you first started? What was the hardest thing to adjust to? Oh, air conditioning. You live in a really hot, oh, it's humid area. So that, that I mean, of course, it, you know, anybody, the, it, air conditioning is tough. I mean, it, it was tough because mm -hmm. our first, it's not tough anymore, but our first full year down there, we had a drought and it was over a month, it was over a hundred degrees and it didn't cool off. It was like 85 at night. I mean, it was terrible. Oh. <laughs> and uh, we had grown, a, started a 10,000 square foot garden with Belgians. We, we didn't really know much of anything and we didn't have water source. So oh. we were hauling water from the pond. We had to do the garden and it was so hot. You get up in the morning and you just pray that the, for night, the sun would go down. <laughs> so that was, that was a little challenging. Mm -hmm. So we said after that, if we could do that and make it through that summer, we could do anything. And then and since then, it's just been great. We we figured out ways to stay cooler. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have more tr trees, you know, to shade and just different things you do. We put another building next door that gives you a little shade, you know, and then you kind of know what to do. And in the morning you do your work and mm -hmm. then afternoons you might rest or do mm -hmm. something where you're not moving around too much. And then the evening when the sun goes down, you do your work again. So you just kind of, you know, learn to work around it. Yeah. But yeah, air conditioning is a problem. And I think for a lot of people, especially what if something happens and mm -hmm. the power grid goes down and you don't, it's the middle of summer. You know, a lot of you guys are gonna, you know, freak out, you know, you know, start doing little experiments at home. Maybe don't have the air conditioning on or spend some time outside because you're used to staying in the same temperature all the time. and you know, going from your car, going from work, you know, going here and not having that temperature fluctuations. Yeah. It's really important to have the differences um, and feel the temperature changes. You know, if it's too hot, if it's too cold, your body needs that, your nervous system needs it. And when we get too used to the same things, you get soft <laughs> and it's not good for your health. And then when you do get hot, you get overheated, you could get heat stroke. So these things, you know, just take things, you know, little at a time, you know, we take cold showers. That's another thing mm -hmm. that totally saved our lives too, because it's so good for your immune system. So we were taking cold showers and a lot of people think you're crazy about cold showers too. Um, but it started our health. My skin was better. My hair was better. My immune system was better. Your nervous system is better because your body knows you're going to go in this freezing cold water and it gets better. So for some of you guys, the challenge for you is to possibly, you know, take a shower, take your warm shower. And at the end, maybe for start 15 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, put it on a cold shower and it totally will wake you up, get the brain fog away. And it's just amazing. So, wow. Well, that's great. Yeah. I see we have a lot of people headed out our way. So I think <laughs> I think we're about yeah, to be right back on a tour. I think we're going to a bison ranch today and yep. all sorts of interesting and things. And we're going to learn some stuff. Yeah, about all sorts salt. of things. So thank you so much for coming on today. I think this has been really helpful for people just to look at what are the different benefits, really, that you may not even be considering when it comes to going off grid. And sure, I love, sure. I love the health aspect of that. I think that's I know that's incredible. totally that, that's totally I think what, what made it for for us and the byproduct of going off grid off grid was making us have a healthier lifestyle and healthy life for all of us. That so. is so neat. Okay. And I, it was so nice to finally finally meet yeah, you. I know. It's a good thing to get to actually hang out. I know. So it's I really know. fun. We've been kind of geeking out on the health stuff because we both love that. So yeah, it's been no. a lot of fun. So, hey, you guys, thanks for hanging out with us. We will see you next week for the Pantry Chat. And check us out on Off Grid with Doug and Stacy oh, on absolutely. YouTube. Yeah, go check over their videos, especially some of their fermenting videos. Go, go watch those and see because even if you're not going completely off grid, 
you can still get some of those same health benefits, right? Sure, or learning anything yeah. about off-grid living, period. So come check us Sounds out. Good. Okay, thank you guys. Goodbye. All right, we'll see you later.